horizon. There's no. What about Qt six? Yeah, but that's only a minor. Like they, the Qt project when they went to six, they said, you know, this is just a minor cleanup. It's not anything major mm. breaking. Um, and and, and I, I, think we can, I, I think we could actually transition to Qt six in the middle of a Qt just three point mm -hmm. whatever without without big issues. Um, what about the Qt Python bindings, the native ones rather than SIP? Um, yeah, like I said, uh, to kind of clarify uh, what Tim's referring to there is um, the Python support that is available for QGIS, it's, there's a library that kind of makes that possible. Um, and we've, we've been looking at whether the library that we use at the moment, which is the PyQt library, um, this SIP tool is the best solution or if there's better ones out there. Um, and this is this is something that I definitely would say should be um, bumped off to 4.0 because it's such an intrusive change and such a potential for... Um, it's going to break everybody's plugins. Break, won't break everybody's plugins, but there's like a, a pretty good chance that, you know, going from one, one underlying library to another will just trade one set of bugs for another set of bugs. And then it's a matter of working out <laughs> which set of bugs is is better and how you know which ones we can work around which ones we can fix and which ones are kind of uh by design in the library i guess um so this is something that's you know big red flag proceed with super caution and and don't rush into anything as well um are you are you sure it won't break um the api because we won't have SIP anymore, right? How are we going to all the the bindings will be exposed? Yeah, it, 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 they, they, sorry, there will be there will be minor changes, um, but but all the 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 kind of changes that would come are, are really kind of corner cases that would be easy to identify. So like, um, uh, I don't want to get super technical, but there's like a call you can do, you know, SIP dot is deleted to tell if an underlying C++ object's deleted, like that would have to change to something else, but it's, it, it would be easy for somebody to search for that. And they, they, if anything, they'll, they'll use it like once or twice in their whole 10,000 line Python plugin. Um, and does some yeah. poor stuff have to go through the whole QGIS code base and change all the sub annotations to some new? Uh, yeah, that's that's someone else's job. <laughs> that's a job for a script. <laughs> a robot uh, script. Um, but yeah, anyway, so so that's my thoughts on 4.0. I don't know if you have different thoughts, Tim, about timing of that or the motivation between behind going yeah to a, a big i'm not interested in 4.0 i think we get like enough features like we don't have a model where well not i'm not interested of course i always want a new shiny number but you know we have a model where features aren't like we're not conservative about adding features in you know one version once it's been sort of rolled out um so like there's enough features flowing into three for the, now and into the future that it's not like um uh, uh, feeling like we're missing out on something by, by not jumping to a four and making some breaking change, or whatever. I think the only like areas of breaking change for me would be interesting would be like reimagining how the Python plugin frameworks work, uh, so that you can have like a package management system for Python dependencies. But you can go look at there's a QEP somewhere, and that, that stuff is so complicated, <laughs> <laughs> endless circle discussions that it's like yeah i don't think that's the 4.0 horizon topic anyway yeah um, and, and and actually i think a lot of that could be bolted on without you know you can bolt on a lot of stuff in python by kind of just mm -hmm. uh, you're doing things you maybe shouldn't um <laughs> but you know you can you can you can kind of uh fake stuff in python put in little compatibility layers and all this sort of stuff to mm -hmm. mean that we could, we, we're not really bound by 4.0 to, yeah. to make a change like that either. Um, actually, the other, the other big motivation when QGIS 3 came out was that there was a whole lot of really, really old code in QGIS itself that we just wanted to get rid of um, that had been there for like, since it, you know, since day one almost. Um, uh, and that, you know, that same situation isn't really, or well, the same motivation isn't it? Uh, around anymore that that code's gone it's disappeared things are looking nice and clean and there's not really um the situation where 
we're being held back by any legacy codes like we were back in the, the two point whatever days. Yeah, I think not any, uh, go ahead, Amy. Um, no, there's just a hand up in the room. Ah, uh, that's yours, or Benjamin is giving us a thumbs up. I presume Benjamin's saying he agrees that there's enough cool stuff coming down, down the pipe that he's not rushing for 4.0. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. thank you for all answering uh, that many of my, my personal questions relating to QGS 4.0. Uh, there's only one left, um, 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 uh, and I, as I understood, the, the QGS 4.0 issue tracker in the repository for um, there um, uh, was an idea to to change this um, the way how these panels are organized in QGS, and, and by now it's uh, we have this central map canvas, and everything is. Um, um, used um, as a cute uh, panel around it and uh, will there be the chance to somehow break it a bit up to have, for example, to allow to have um, um, two or more um, uh, maps um, side by side, but not um, uh, only as a central uh, main map canvas. Would this be possible as you might know from uh, many remote sensing applications, for example, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so um, this is actually something that I'm going to be investigating as part of, uh, there, was a, there was a crowdfunding campaign that was run kind of last year, end of last year, early this year for the next round of um, QGIS 3D slash point cloud improvements and the profile tool and all this sort of stuff. Um, part of that has actually we got flagged is, is to investigate if we can um, change that docking map system to a, a more modern one without causing issue for plugins and such. Um, so fingers crossed, you know, there, there's, there is a better solution out there for that. Um, and the, it's one of those ones, it actually is being held back by the fact that we've got this stable API and we don't want to break existing plugins. So, you know, maybe we can find a way to kind of plug that in and put in one of those Python compatibility layers to make that possible. And then we would be able to have a better docking system where you could have like tabbed maps and whatever kind of configuration you want. <coughs> and like uh, the 3D maps sort of tabbed with 2D maps or pull them out to full main windows and all this kind of nice stuff that um, is a bit kind of fiddly to manage in QGIS right now. So we are back up and running on YouTube, just on a different live stream link. There are a bunch of people that have joined and we have a question from Jack Dudman. I thought for a minute you said Jack Dangerman. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, geometry generators look like great functionality, but I struggle to think of a use case. Can the presenters briefly describe some examples where they've been used slash might be useful? Oh, that's an awesome question. Uh, mm. I like it. Um, Tim, <laughs> Tim, do you want to go first? Um, I wasn't listening well because there's something <laughs> in the background. So, what is it? What, what, what's the point of geometry generators? Was that yeah, yeah, that's, that's yes. pretty much the question. That's the question. You, you wow. give some so you them all on a daily basis. <laughs> Whenever yeah. I'm too lazy to buffer a point or something for a map or something, I just put a geometry generator around it. Or um, what kind of things do I use them for? Smoothing out lines in a map, which I'm making, and I don't want to create, like anything where you don't want to create a new geometry or go and write a Postgres view to like uh, make it like an intermediate state of the geometry. I just put a, yeah. a geometry generator in there. Scale-based smoothing and simplification is a great, great example. So you could have a, you could use a smooth or a simplify function that's uh, varies the tolerance of that smooth or simplified depending on the map scale so um you know you're not pre-processing your data you're just changing how it renders it on the fly um I'll go, I'll, things like making label label um lines for labels to run on and um Oh, there's so many, if your imagination gets going, there's so many things you can do with them. Can I, can I show an example that I was working on yeah. uh, last week? Um, 
We should make it compulsory to have a queue just session up on the screen the whole time through this chat. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, this, so this is a map that uh, I was actually working on for my father-in-law. So he's uh, he's involved in this project to put a um, like a rail trail, a, a bicycle trail along an old rail corridor um, in this this region where he lives. Um, and he asked me to make a map for him that kind of they can use to as a marketing tool to go to potential sponsors and such and say this is a good idea because of these reasons um this is like super early this map you know i've, I've actually picked colors that were horrible because i, I was sent off a, um i sent off a mock -up to them and i didn't want them to be uh i didn't want them to actually pay attention to the color or the styling of the map because it was too like it's Oh, I didn't, I'm not at that stage for this map yet. But the, the the reason I wanted to show this one is um, what I wanted to do here is I wanted to have these kind of central points. So like this is, uh, you know, town, Canberra. These are towns kind of along the route of this uh, green bicycle track. Um, and they had points that they wanted to raise for each of these or highlight, I guess, for each of these sort of uh, towns um, of why this is a good, a good investment, this bike, bike track thing. Um, so I kind of was playing around with this, uh, and I, I I really wanted them to to come out like these sort of spider things from this these uh, central points like this uh, with these things. Um, and when I first started just mocking up this layout that I wanted to get their approval on, I was doing this by hand and just kind of positioning these points. Um, but it got really annoying because uh, you you don't you know it's really hard to kind of put them in in the right spots um so in the end uh i'm actually using a geometry generator here oh. that uh so the geometry generator i've i've just dumped these points randomly the actual dots like if you look at the the feature it, it it's not sitting where the the dot is here um and the geometry generator is actually basically projecting that point out at a certain angle and putting it so they're all nicely the exact same distance um in millimeters from this this central dot. Um, and if I look at the actual table structure here, that's kind of driving this, uh, it's got this, this column here, which is like um, how far out that gets exploded. Those, those spiders kind of blow out. Um, and that's all, that's all driven by this big, this big geometry generator here that, that um, finds where the points link back to, works out the sort of the azimuth of where they are, but then projects them at that fixed distance so that they're all exactly at the right spot. Um, the next stage actually what I was going to do with this geometry generator is force them to be the same, like equal angles, because you can see here, you know, they're not, they're not, the angles are, are different. They're not cutting that sort of pie into the right uh, set of shapes, but um, but I have to, I was waiting on the the client, my father-in-law to say that, yeah, this kind of general layout is what he's looking for for this map. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to put a nice hill shade in the background there, nice styling and uh, make it actually look presentable. But yeah, geometry generator is great for that. Um, actually, another one that I that I really like that you can do in uh, QGIS, QGIS 3.24, um, you can make a geometry generator that does this. I'll just load in there. Okay, so here, just a, a dummy line sort of layer. Um, uh, I could make a geometry generator in QGIS 3.24. Um, it's got this new option here where you can change the, the units for a geometry generator from being at map units to being in a kind of paper unit, like millimeters. Um, so if I get that and I combine it with this new function, which is uh, wave randomized. So if I do this wave random randomized the geometry, and then I put in um, the kind of, uh, what, what does this take? Wave randomized. So it wants the, the minimum wavelength, maximum wavelength, minimum amplitude, maximum amplitude. That's kind of the arguments I've got there. And they're in they're in millimeters. So minimum wavelength, let's do one to five. And our amplitude can go from zero to 10 millimeters. Um, and now I get these kind of pretty crazy looking random waves on there. <laughs> um, but if I make this a bit more subtle, let's pull this move. I'll just change out the points, push this out a bit. 
Um, you can get uh, you can get sketchy, a nice line. sketchy line kind of effect. Um, that's going to be. I'll turn this one off here. That so that's the original line that I haven't changed. Um, you can get yeah this sketchy line kind of symbology thing. Um, so yeah, that's a you know another kind of example of a geometry generator. So I'm using this function here to to make. Was there a seed argument that you could pass it so that it was deterministic? And the... yep, the last yeah. argument there is the seed. So so now it's nice and stable. Um, and there's actually a bunch there. So if I look under here, wave, there's you can do square wave or triangular wave as well. So if I do triangular, then it's like jagged jagged kind of waves maybe good for some styles <laughs> um but you know this is all it's all kind of just tools so it's tools for people to to plug into their symbology um but definitely this this kind of effect is great for just giving a bit more variation on that otherwise quite boring looking straight line um effect um, and you can kind of use it to get like a cartoon effect or a hand-drawn effect or uh, even just a little bit of visual kind of breakup in the in the otherwise GIS looking shapes that you got there. To improve um, in QGIS as a whole, not the, not the program. But was the I, was I sharing you. my screen then or not? Yeah, yes. yeah you were. You were oh, yeah. But I'm not anymore. <laughs> No, I just went to, <laughs> okay, I just went to turn it off. I was like, was, was I just being a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So what, what would you improve in QGIS as a whole, Alex is asking now. Uh, okay, so Alex's question, I think, was... Um, uh, the, okay, I, I think the number one thing um, that needs improving in QGIS, and probably anyone who's used QGIS for a period of time would would raise their hand and say, yep, 100%, um, is the attribute table. So uh, let me just share my screen again, because why not? Um, so the attribute table being this thing, where you get that kind of spreadsheet view of your data, uh, works fine for a table with seven features in it. But when you go to work with a table that's got seven million or seven billion features in it, um, this thing's got major performance issues. Uh, and they, they're, they're issues that really need um, a, a ground up rewrite of this whole kind of attribute table functionality in QGIS. Um, so that's, you know, that is the big, the big glaring one, I would say, is screaming for the most, <laughs> you know, the most work. But it's also, it's a really tricky one because um, uh, it's a big project. It's kind of like probably two months development work, maybe three months development work to do it properly. Um, and it's hard for hard to get investment for something like that, where it's not a big new feature, you know, it's not a big, it's not a little bug fix, it's not a big new feature. It's a it's a big change to give us back the same thing as we've got, but that works nicer. <laughs> um, and it's hard for, I guess, uh, organizations to kind of justify that type of investment. Um, and unfortunately, it's a little bit too, the, the amount of work that's required exceeds what uh, the, the kind of standard QGIS development grants, which are designed for this kind of behind the scenes work um, are tailored for. Um, it's also a super tricky project in that there's so many interplay and uh, factors involved in doing this. There's really a, a quite limited um, pool of developers who would even be able to take that that kind of project on in the first place. Um, and I think it doesn't help as well that it actually would it actually be a horrible job to work on. It'd be like two or three months of uh, of ex <laughs> yeah, you know, excruciating code of, and it's not like a fun project in any way it's a it would be quite a painful task to to do so mine yeah. really dovetails a bit with yours um which is that because uh, the question was also about QGIS as the project as a whole and i think we don't really have i mean the project i think is you know i listen to a lot of open source pod you know linux and other open source type podcasts and things and listen to what other projects are doing and i think we are pretty good like we will set up as a project in terms of our governance and all the structures we have in place. But the thing I always dreamed of 
is having something more like what Blender has, which is like a professional like core of people involved in the project that are like, you know, imagine hiring Niall and uh, Jürgen and uh, Alessandra and, you know, a bunch of the core developers just full time paid by our, you know, endless funds that we receive through our fundraising programs or what have you. And um, that you that you that you don't have to do client work and you can actually dig into those like big hairy jobs knowing that you, you're funded and um you know we've been trying to make gradual steps i mean the the the, the crowd the not the the, the fund the cutest funded work and so on it's like just stepping stones towards that but um there's so many areas in QGIS which uh really need professional staff like the the pull request queue <laughs> Which Niall, you know, he's a superhero in dealing with what he does, and and you're not know, the only one to know. But uh, no, but um, but still, you can't keep up with everything that goes through there, or spend the time on it, or uh, uh, yeah, there's probably other issues on. That's probably not the best example because there should also be some like funding from the people who, who are building features to actually take take care of that. But um, there's so many parts in QGIS core that are just like not funding. Um, yeah, not, not funding friendly. Yeah, like going and changing all the Python bindings so that we can use a new Python infrastructure. Nobody wants to fund that. They just want to fund the things that answer their direct questions. So for me, I'm still like hoping that one day we can come up with a model where, you know, maybe it's one day a week we can say to now, like every every Monday, it's you just fund a day and like two, then two days a week, three days a week, and then two people and four people and whatever, until we've got a core of dedicated people that are really just um, on top of QGIS. And and uh, like it sort of also dovetails in with my other thing, which is um, like the stability of the software. It's like for me, it's something I, I would almost like to drop all feature development for a year and just say, let's just make QGIS the most stable software out there um, because it's always, uh, I've, I've always find it like I, I used to like I'm in this unfortunate situation where I'm so used to the fact that Q just crashes that it's almost like I defensively use it like saving my project every five seconds so that, you know because I'd never know when it will crash and it's certainly got a lot better but there is some like the three stuff at the moment it's just like uh, it crashes like you change the spin box it crashes you pan to the left it crashes what it is so um detracts from the user experience by having that, that I would love to just see some time that we step back and just say, okay, let's screw all the new features and all that other kind of cool stuff that comes down the line, just focus on just getting what's in queue just, just to be rock solid. Um, probably both of mine are impossible dreams at the moment, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting, I think it's like an interesting change has happened. So I, I always used to look back at, um you know, going back maybe three or four years ago, two or three years ago, maybe let's say, um, I, I would always like hold QGIS project up on a pedestal and say, this is an example of a, of a fantastic open source project in terms of the, the governments, the governance that sits behind it, that kind of structure and the community that's been set up. Um, it is really one of those like shining lights of like, this is how a project can be run in a, in a good way. Um, and it had definitely sort of, uh, or it has definitely transitioned from being like a, a hobby sort of project where it's a bunch of people, bunch of developers who just write it for themselves. And that's the whole intention of the project to something that's actually professional and um, treated both by users and by the, the development community in the project as a professional piece of software. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of would, would have held it up on that pedestal alongside things like PostGIS and, um, uh, you know, there's kind of uh, really respected open source projects. Um, and then the interesting thing I think that has changed in the last two to three, two years maybe, is that this kind of Blender organization came along and has basically rewritten the rules about how open source funding can, can happen. And you look at, at Blender now and, you know, it's got a multi-million maybe mm. would that be right it'd be close to, be close to at least a million well, maybe yeah. multi-million you know yearly budget where it's the the big names are all behind it you know it's amazon and and, and microsoft and all that other other apple even uh, i think 
yeah um and i i didn't see that happening you know i didn't see that happening three years ago that that blender would become this massive uh <laughs> source of finances i guess um and you know now now a lot of other open source projects are looking at that and going well how can we have that kind of level of success as well and how come you know how can we get that level of buy-in from google or from microsoft and facebook and all that sort of stuff that we know use our application but aren't aren't giving us funds for it um and the good thing is you know so so uh gdel was i guess in a similar kind of boat uh but they're a long way towards that blender kind of situation now where they do have yearly funding that um comes from some of these big names uh and is substantial amount and actually means that uh there's so so evan route evan route um sorry my pronunciation is horrible um you know can be basically employed by gdel to work on gdel um and i'm also in a situation where i can get uh i've I've been contracted by the GDEL org to to work on GDEL as well for some hours per week. Um, so you know that's great. Like that's that's a fantastic outcome, and uh, uh, so much of so much of in, in QGIS and every single open source geospatial software relies on GDEL. That it's great to see that that's that's kind of hit that, or you know, getting to that goal of being a properly funded. And so yeah, you know, fingers crossed. One day QGIS will also be at that sort of uh at that sort of level cool i've posted some of the questions that we're getting in on youtube into the chat um there are quite a few uh, i don't yeah. know who you <laughs> just have a look at let's those do the, let's do the technical things are more fun <laughs> or like yeah having, having natural sorting <laughs> what how to do natural sorting with curious expressions I don't know the answer to that. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll answer that one straight off. Okay, so so my say my answer would be um, right right. Uh, you can you can make your own expression function using Python um, through the. Uh, let me share my screen again. Um, here we go. Hide that back here. Uh, when you go into this, you've got this function editor that lets you write a a Python. Um, uh, you know, custom function using just standard Python code. So I would say if, if you want to make a certain uh, sort that uses natural sort or some other kind of complex sorting rules, put it in here in this, make a custom function that can compare to or can do sort a list or something like that um, and use use that to, to do it. That's my answer for that question. <laughs> I guess the part he was looking for was where the code gets filled in. Also, when we press the plus button, as well as the um, stab for the code. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So then, then you go into gis.stackexchange and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, someone there to write your code. Uh, what <laughs> the feature from. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, so so the the short answer, the the answer of appropriate depth for this. For this forum is that use a use a custom Python function and you could definitely do whatever you want with sorting in expressions. Sorry if that's not the, the level that we we want here. <laughs> so um, um, oh, here's, here's, here's another question about okay. geometry generator. Is there a possibility to dissolve geometries of polygons grouping by field using geometry generator? Um, so that actually, if I can go back and I'll share my screen yet again, uh, there is, let me find a, let me make a dumb data set. Um, let me just throw this together quickly. Uh, I, I can't remember when this one came. I'm, I'm going to guess QGIS 3.20. Um, I might be wrong. Um, but there is a there's a renderer you can use here that's called the merged feature renderer, and you'll notice when I switch across to that merged features, then my uh, those two overlapping polygons get rendered as though they've been dissolved and merged and rendered as one as one um, object now. Um, and this one lets you actually you can do the grouping if you change this sub renderer to say categorized. Um, I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if I had some attributes in there, then I could I could set that up. Uh, but but this merged feature 
merged feature renderer with a sub renderer that actually sets up your categories is, is the way to go for that. This one was written actually, uh, this merge feature um, for, for a similar kind of use case actually. And, but it is also really nice if you have this kind of data set where you've got um, uh, if you've got a line layer say, and you know, maybe this is a, a railway line and it kind of, the person who's digitized it or the, the agency where it's coming from has done it like this, where it's got a whole bunch of different line segments and they, they kind of join, but they're actually different features. Um, and then you want to set it up like with a nice symbol like this, but you don't want it to be that you get this kind of breakage where those, those things join or disc discontinuity, that kind of thing. Um, you can use this merged features one for that. And now it's treated as one big line when it's rendering. So the, the symbology looks perfect. Um, yeah, another handy. Yeah, another cartography question if I can still, still head in the queue. How do you get um, a, a dashed line uh, for polygons to work nicely? Because I, if you've got a JSON polygons with a shared bound. Oh, like, okay, so you got... Um, um, I, I actually don't. So what I do in this situation, so just to, just to clarify Tim's question, it's when you've got something like this, no, let me just actually get a proper data set. Uh, good example would be like some cadastral boundaries or. Yeah. Uh, and now I've got to try and find that. Now I've got to, I've got to find something on my laptop that's, uh, yeah. What have I got? Okay, so something like this. Yeah. Um, and then we go in and we want it to be just, say, the outline, but you want the outline to be, say, a, a dash line. Um, then you get this sort of situation where the, the dashes are, they they don't line up with each other. Um, they're the, the two features. Yeah, they're not synchronized with each other. Um, it's, it's an annoying one. I... My solution when I hit this is usually I go into here and I look for this grass tool that's uh, v.2, I think it's this one, v.2 lines. No, it's not that. Uh, is it, I don't remember, boundary or something, I think it's called. Nah. Of course, I'd forget when I have to do it. Oh. Um, and you just get the, the shared boundaries out. Yeah, you just get the shared boundaries out as a line, and I have that as a separate layer in my um, in my project. That's just mm. the, the boundaries. So then I style the polygons in one way, and I have the bond, the boundaries that are um, sitting on top as a different um, thing. Mm. So, so the reason I use this grass tool is because grass is, uh, you know, like it's uh, topologically. Model. Yeah, topological model, that's the word for it. Um, and so it will do that thing. It'll work out the shared boundaries and then I can get that out as just a line layer. Um, I think it's this one. Yeah, so if I do that, I run that tool. I should get out, whoops, I did the wrong, I didn't do it right. Convert from that to lines. Uh, output's empty. <laughs> <laughs> Did I do the right one? Maybe I didn't do the right one. Let's try that. Nah, still didn't get it. Uh, anyway, the, the yeah, yeah, I get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I. I'm Is that? I mean, I don't remember. Do, do other software manage that any better? I mean, even like Inkscape or uh, mm. Do they have any clever? You know, the one that I come back to, and I end up using this one a lot, uh, is this map shaper tool. So mm. map shaper.org. Um, this, this um, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, actually, the reason I like this one is um, if I go back in here, let me let me pull this one back to something that's say like that. Okay, so if I export this as a good old shape file so that I can pull it into that, that tool, uh, let's just chuck it in here. Um, Okay, 
so I've got a, just a shape file of those polygons and we throw it in here. Um, so this one works out those shared boundaries, but then you can do a, um, an interactive simplification on it that's respecting those shared boundaries. So I usually use this, this is part of my workflow actually, is um, if I'm making a map, I'll sort of set the scale in this to what the output will be and then go into this simplify tool and work out how far I want to push the simplification so that I don't get this um, this really kind of gis -y look of way too much detail, way too many nodes and these these features. Um, so if this was kind of my scale, I'd, I'd probably pull it back to something maybe like that. Then I'd export that back to a shape file and then pull that back into my my project and use that as the boundary layer. Um, this is, this is a like it's it's a great website. I hate the fact that I have to export, go into a website, pull my data back out. Um, but uh, yeah, at the moment, this this kind of tool is actually, I think, the best for doing this that there is. One day I would love to get the JavaScript code behind this and make it a, mm. a tool, <laughs> you know, a QGIS plugin or something. Um, or uh, yeah. Well, maybe it's out there in one of the what's it white or yeah, it's <laughs> it's, it's not really. I mean, there's even there's even an R library that that uses this JavaScript code because it's kind of <laughs> everybody loves it. You know, it's a, it's a great yeah. tool, but it, having it as a website like this, it doesn't it means it's really hard to play in bigger workflows like um, mm. like you know an R an R script or QGIS processing model or something like that. Um, but it's still great. You know, I I use it. Every single map I make, I go to this one, and I'll simplify the, the the boundaries using this. There you go. How about the question about cap styles from Bedrin? Yeah, uh, let me have a look at that question. When I use, for example, scale of one to one thousand in, in a drawing, and I have ten meter line in the project according to this reference system, I get a one point one centimeter line in display. Um, uh, I got. I've got to interpret this question. <laughs> I, I use example scale one to one thousand in drive ten meter line in projector coordinate system. I get one point one seven. Uh, okay. So, so if I'm interpreting this question correctly, so I'll, um, I'll have to. Uh, I, I'm going to try and re or paraphrase this question so that uh, mm. the people on the, the recording will, will know what it is. I don't think they have this this chat here. Um, so the question is, if, if you have a, a line and you've set your map scale to 1 to 1,000, um, Actually, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling. Sorry. So, so 10 meter. So, what I think he's saying is that the the line comes out longer than. Uh, okay, let me try to paraphrase. He's got a he's got a map at a certain <laughs> scale, one thousand. He draws a 10, 10, uh, 100 meter line or ten meter line. He's expecting it to be one centimeter on the display, but it comes out a little bit longer because the caps on the end get added. To the end of the line instead of included. In oh, the okay, the right. Line. Yeah. Okay. So, so the right. question is, why is the why is the default square instead of flat? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, the, let, let's let's jump back to QGIS uh, just to demonstrate this. So, um, uh, well, let's just look. At, so, so basically, the question goes like this: Is if there was a line that was on my map um, and this line is 10 meters long, um, but the default kind of style in QGIS is if I push this up, uh, it's using this cap style, which is square. And we can actually see in this tiny little, um, this little icon that's previewing it, that the, the blue line is getting drawn a little bit past the yellow dash there. Um, so let me just for a second. So here we go. So this is the actual line as it exists in that that layer. This big red line that I've made a bit fatter extends past the edges of there. So, so the question is, is this misleading, and why is this one the default? Um, I'd say that's a really good question, and I, I haven't had anyone ask that before. 
Do um, we have a flat, if you pull the list down there, is there a flat style there? Yeah, there is, if we go like that. So flat gives us that hard cutoff mm -hmm. right at the edge there. Um, I think that's a perfectly valid this, question. This is the kind of thing that you could just say, oh, <laughs> I just changed the default because nobody um, ever thought of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then and then my, um, my also, I, I think probably that is a better choice. Um, Either that or, or I actually always end up going back to round because I think round looks nicer for both these settings. Um, but that's that's when I'm making maps for cartography. I'm not really making maps for exact distance measurements, just in my personal work. Um, I, th I think that's a really good thing. I think that actually should be that. And it, yeah, good, good point. You get you get a trophy for um <laughs> <laughs> a great a great question <laughs> that's made us all think. <laughs> it's probably be cathedral and ask the questions from top to bottom, but they <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're coming for really quick. Um, what else have we got? How um someone's got to hear a question. How can we make geometry generator caching the context using QGIS server and too efficient to use on the fly? Uh, okay, let me let me. I should. Just leave my screen share going, shouldn't I? Um, so if I had a geometry generator and I wanted to basically cache that result, I guess if they're, if that's your um, the the term you want. So geometry generators are always rendered on the fly. It's as I kind of zoom into that map and it's redrawing it. It's calculating that new geometry using the expression that I put in there. If I actually wanted to kind of bake that geometry into the layer instead of it being a geometry generator, um, but actually like the pre-calculated thing, I would either use the processing toolbox. There's a tool in here that is geometry by expression. Geometry by expression, which lets me um, put a geometry expression in there to, to create a new layer. And that could be a geo package or a shape file or a postgres layer or whatever. Um, so you could copy and paste your geometry generator expression into this box here and get a copy of the layer where those generated geometries are, are sort of hard coded in there. Um, that's one approach, this geometry by expression. Um, another approach, similar kind of, um, similar kind of thought is you can do, you can actually do this. You can do the field calculator and go, <coughs> if you go update existing field, you've got an option there to update the geometry. So again, you could paste the, the geometry generator expression in there um, and replace the geometry in, in place with that new kind of modified. It would be nice to have a second geometry column. We've discussed it before. I think I don't know where the discussion landed up, right? It should be like, um, you know, th this is the original geometry of the feature, and this is my smoothed one or whatever. You yeah, well, you, you can do that in um, like Postgres supports yeah. multiple geometry columns. Unfortunately, Geo Package doesn't. Like that was one of it's one of the limitations in Geo Package, which annoys me. But um, that that's got a single geometry thing. Um, but what you could do again is uh, if it's so if it's a a like a Postgres table where it actually has this sort of native support for multiple geometry columns, you could you could again pre-calculate that geometry using one of those tools and then set the geometry generator to use that secondary field, the second geometry, second geometry field or the third geometry field. Um, and then it's just, it's not actually recalculating it, it's just getting it from the database. Um, even with a geo package where you can only have a single geometry field, you could still make a text field and save that geometry into there as like a WKT string or some other kind of, uh, yeah, WKT is probably the most appropriate and then use um, use the, uh, use a geometry generator with, with the function that goes geometry from WKT to turn that back into an actual shape that you can render. So you could put it in a text, a text call. In the, um, in the layer, in the field calculator, um, if you had two geometry fields in Postgres, I don't, I don't think you can like um, write into the second one. Mm, I'm not sure. So you'd have to do some like like similar intermediate step, like writing it into some other structure and then going in your. I. View. By which time you might as well. I don't know. I mean, 
that would be an artificial limitation if it is there. It's probably it might just be <laughs> it might just be a matter of saying, hey, don't hide that column from this list and mm. show me my secondary geometry. Um, yeah. Cool tip. There's a um, Alicia had the funny. He said a silly question earlier. He removed the silly. Thank goodness, because he wants to know about how to perform spatial aggregation of mesh data. I think I don't know how good your mesh skills are, but probably that's kind of thing. If you get a like Vincent Chloric in as a as a guest and ask him a bunch of mesh kind of questions. Yeah, I reckon I <laughs> I defer that question to uh to either. To one of the lutcher people, so Peter or Vincent or, or Martin, and so I'm going to give a I'm going to give a glib <laughs> glib response now, which is, oh, you could do that writing Python. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a bingo card going for how many times we, the answer is uh, yes, you can do this, write some Python. Geometry <laughs> um, generators seem to be such a popular topic today. Um, any way to freeze the geometry generator result? Thomas is also asking. I guess Thomas Thomas Gretier, is it you? Um, he's doing a lot of playing around with geometry generators these days. Well, the freezing is what we just talked about now, anyway. Yeah, that's it's just a different way of phrasing that same question. Um, I'm mm -hmm. trying to scroll back and see if we've missed any here. Um, I like that cap style question because I, you know, I, was, I often thought, oh, we should use the round cap style as a default because whenever I do roads. I hate these little jagged corners that come out. Oh, me too. Like I, yeah, I, I always change it to round because I like the, the appearance better. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's a there's a point here. Someone or Thomas has raised in the chat about um, going back to the, the that discussion about Blender finances, um, where Thomas says, so in his opinion, Blender cash, Blender gets more money because it's used for billion dollar games or cinema uses with budget mm -hmm. higher than GIS usage. I think that's a fair point, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I've, I mean, I've got direct experience with engineering organizations and mining organizations who use QGIS and their budgets are easily multi-million dollar, you know, multiple, probably multi-billion dollar projects that they're using QGIS for as well um, in that engineering realm. So I don't know if, you know, I don't, I don't think yeah. it's directly We're attributed to in the, in the equation of like how important QGIS is in in the financial, you know, uh, like um, pool of money being spent on software and whatever. I think um, I, I found that there's been a whole but a lot of topic uh, topical discussions about this sort of funding streams for open source projects. And there was this um, colors.js. Did you see this um, news article about this guy? Sort of oh, like he put, a, put it down his library. Yeah, he, he did a mic drop basically, and he said, uh, "He pays me, and I, I hate you all, so I'm going to add like this like nasty message or whatever, liberty, 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 or something." Put in, and all these big cloud providers um, got sort of like ambushed by his his um, his patch that he did. But uh, like at the end of the day, we do write software which we know you give away for free, so. That's like the implicit transaction. Okay, is we're giving this, we're giving away our work. Um, uh, but so it's not like we can. Like I don't have this thing. Like okay, the Amazon are yeah. It's a, it would be nice. It's great if they contribute, but at the same time, if you don't like them using it, then put your software in a, under a different license, which prevents them from doing it. And um, but at this, like, I think we need to make an argument for funding which is more based on practicality rather than trying to guilt trip companies. And one of the practicalities was like the GDO one, which was like the project's going to implode because we, we just can't sustain it. You know, who can help us? You know, rather than, oh, you're, big, you're making big bucks, like share your bucks with us. You know, <laughs> it's a kind of like entry point into the discussion. Um, yeah, it's. Uh... It is. I mean, I, I think people who are, I think organizations, I guess, who are looking at it properly are treating it as like a risk management uh, strategy. You know, like the, if you're looking at, we rely on this software and it it's driving out whatever, $10, $10 billion a year project. Uh, they should be looking at it and saying, well, where's the risk factors in that? You know, these all these sort of libraries that sit behind it, are they 
going to disappear one day because they've got no funds and people don't want to work on them anymore. Um, you know, to me, that's a that's basic business kind of uh, strategy. Um, but I, it's I I don't know this this topic about like supporting open source maintainers. I I flip backwards and forwards on it all the time because you go through different periods like where you where you have a super stressful month and you know you get a few annoying people who send you these abusive emails out of the blue for for no reasons and it can it can bring you down instantly kill your motivation like you, when you check your phone in the morning and you, you've got a bunch of these kind of emails you're like well you know i'm done like what's the point anymore um but then you know the next week you get some great feedback and you get some <laughs> some good projects and stuff and then all of a sudden it's like this is great again you know it's it's fine um i yeah, to be honest like, like emails you got um no without reading them out loud <laughs> what, what kind of <laughs> people have the gumption to to say to you uh, oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same stuff. The same, yeah, it is. It's the mind. same stuff you get from, you know, any open source kind of maintainer just gets, and it takes, it takes a good, I don't know, what do you want to say? Like five years, maybe uh, pick a number, but like it, it takes time for people to develop like that, their own coping strategies for that. And I guess they're, um, um, strength to just let that be like, oh, we'll delete, you know, it doesn't affect me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, obviously not everybody is ever going to be able to reach that stage of being able to just ignore those emails and not be impacted by them. Um, and then that kind of leads to that situation where people will will mic drop or dummy spit or whatever you want to call it um, and, and pull their tool. Um, yeah, I mean, I at the moment, like the, the most, the ones that I get a lot of uh, abusive emails about are, are about the Slayer tool. So um, just to fill, you know, fill viewers in on the situation. So my company, North Road, we, we publish a QGIS plugin for translating ArcGIS styles into QGIS styles. And it lets you like take an ArcGIS project and just drag the MXD into QGIS and you get an exact representation of that. Um, this plugin has taken like probably one or two years development work to get to the stage where it is at the moment. Um, and we sell it as a commercial thing. So we basically say, okay, if, uh, if this, if you want to use it, you've got to buy a license and the license costs this much, um, uh, to recuperate the fact that this tool would not be possible if we didn't, if, you know, there's no way anybody could have spent the amount of time getting to this stage without funds to, to justify that. Um, I get heaps of emails of people abusing me and saying, how dare you charge for this kind of thing? You know, like it's, it should be free. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes sometimes I'll take the bait and I'll just write back and just slam them and say, look, because of these funds, you know, without Slayer's funding, all these tools would never have seen, the, like these features and these fixes would never have seen the, um, the light in QGIS uh, and, because of we charge, this is what we've been able to do. But other times, you know, just delete it and move on with my life. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So th I mean, that's sort of my same my argument as before. It's like if you choose to release it under an open license and you're choosing to give away your time, that's great. You know, what to do, but people have to also pay the bills. So you choose when you write software what license to put it under, and then people can't criticize you for your choice. You know, it's like, um, they can either take the software as it is, or, you know, under the terms you share it, or they can bugger off basically. And, um, and and it goes both ways. Like as a developer, if you chose to put it out under open license, and suddenly people are I don't know taking over the world with it and uh, you know making billions of dollars off your work, but you made the choice. Well, you you make your bed, you have to lie in it. But um, yeah, but that that kind of goes both ways still, Tim. Like, I, uh, you see these examples pop up on Twitter periodically where it's, uh, you know, the, a user from one of these organizations demanding something be fixed. And yeah, but then you, and, you like, you know, I, I do think that there's, there's yeah. expectations on the user side of, mm. okay, well, open source doesn't mean that you get support. You know, that doesn't mean that someone's there to fix your bugs within 24 yeah. hours. It's, the code is open source 
full stop. That's all it means. You know, if that yeah. means that there's a, a great project like QGIS where people are responsive to bug reports, great. If it means that that maintainer is going to say, I don't care, you know, like it doesn't affect me, you're on your own. Like that open source, doesn't, it doesn't imply either way. You know, it's yeah. all it means is the code is open source, full stop, mm -hmm. end of story. Like, so the, yeah, it is, you know, there's a, users need to have the right expectations and the right understanding of what it actually means for it to be successful mm -hmm. for themselves as well. We well, even complicate things a bit further by doing binary releases, because I think that like, if we could almost separate the just the, the code release from the binaries, we'd have we'd be able to offload a bunch a bunch of hassles that people give us about you know the binary not working properly on their system or what have you, which is like um, yeah, poor Jürgen's <laughs> mental health that <laughs> how he survives. But you know, um, in theory, as an open source project, that's your responsibility is to write the source code, right? And then the binaries. You know, yeah like that's a that's a that's an extra benefit if they're there or not you know um hey we've got a question here i, I reckon we move on because i yeah I, yeah you know this is it. <laughs> um there's a question here it says i i've got a question about programming if allowed how can i activate the html annotation tool with PyQ? just i can't find it in the actions list um let me share my screen oh, unless tim did you want to handle this one no, 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 you go ahead. Better. Uh, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> like take over the session. So the question is basically, you've got this, uh, where is it hiding? Uh, this tool, HTML annotation. Um, and if we look back at the PyQ, just PyQ, just API thing. Um, it's not, it, it's not exposed there. This this little button here isn't exposed for somebody to say in their tool, okay, activate that action. Um, the nice thing is, even though it's not formally exposed, all this stuff that we see available or in front of us in the QGIS interface, we can still get to in different ways because we can use um, the PyQt API that sort of lets us talk to widgets and such. Um, so one thing I can do is if I do this, iFace.mainwindow.children to get access here to basically, uh, I get a big list back and it's got all the different widgets and all the different things that are kind of sitting inside this main window. Um, and if I kind of restricted this to say, uh, only give me the, the Q actions. So all of these are Q actions in this toolbar. Only give me those. Ah, what am I missing? Um, Fine by type, isn't it? Something like that? I'll just do this. Uh, is instance a Q action? So that'll give me a list of all the different actions that are here. So all the different menu actions and such. Um, and I could say here. Uh, a dot text equals what's this thing called? HTML annotation. Let's see if we can find it this way. So there we go. So now I could say my HTML action is this thing. Uh, and I could turn it on that way to turn that tool off turn that tool on or off using um, my code. Um, so I, I don't know if this is too small to see. Uh, can I zoom this in? Yes. Well, you, well, you can, Thomas also mentioned that he, he is um, answered the same question on Stack Exchange. Oh, okay. <laughs> Put the link in there if you want to just keep, keep an open as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it kind of looks a bit like this. So I'm going, I'm, I'm just using some Python list comprehension here to say, go through all the children of this main window, this thing that I see in front of me, um, find all the ones where they're an instance of this Q action class and the action text is whatever I'm looking for. And that gives me back just that, that one I'm hunting for. And then I can do whatever I want with it. Disable it. Oops, <laughs> set enabled, maybe it is. Um, 
yeah, anyway, I can I can kind of do anything I want there and, and make my plugin really mess up the QGIS interface in whichever way I want. What you should do is um, next 1st of April, go and rewire all the tools to do other random tools activities as a um, <laughs> Mind-bending exercise. <laughs> what, like a, a companion to the hats plugin that just yeah. uh, <laughs> the hats plugin. If you don't know, the hats plugin makes the cutest icon have like a little Santa hat at Christmas time. Compulsory <laughs> um, install for everybody who installs cutes. Cool. Um, I think we're gonna have to start rounding up, gents. Um, because our next. Um, session starts in about 10 minutes, and I just want to make sure that YouTube isn't having a mild freak out. It's obviously <laughs> not being my friend today. Um, <laughs> so well, if you'd like I, I would wrap up by saying I hope I didn't depress you now in the audience by, by all the talk about <laughs> money and stuff too much. But I mean, it's good. Ah, it's, 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 it's stuff good out there that, you know, like the project, if it wants to grow and sustain itself, people need to earn money some way. Either they're going to work on other stuff, and then QGIS will be a hobby, or I work on QGIS and then somebody pays their salary. So, so like the the user base out there has to decide. And, um, yeah, and uh, you know we said this was a ask me anything. So um, I think I, I I love it that we can jump between all these different topics and mm -hmm. go from technical to cartographic to uh, <laughs> to whatever you want to call it, high level thought pieces, topical financial affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, uh, but I think uh, I think Tim, ne next time next time you have a high level thought piece on open source funding, you should get our uh, Paul Ramsey in. Yeah, he's got great clarity of mind on these kind of things. Yeah. Cool. Um, there's a big there's a big question just came in, but I think we're going to have yeah, to all the session. Well, Cap style is going to take like ten minutes to parse again. We're yeah. doing, we'll we'll an read it and, and then. Uh, uh, digest it offline from the, from, the, from the session. Maybe next month, Niall, we can convince you to come back for more. It's been great mm. to hang out with you. I love it. I love hanging out and just I'll chatting just like this. So, my key just mug on before we go. <laughs> is, that a, is that a love heart one? Yeah. 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 Speak to Amy, she'll hook you up. Yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Actually, there's one last one last question here. Someone just asked. This is a quick one. Is there an exam an overview on past fundings for specific features? Um, it, actually, the roadmap it's the the visual change log itself that comes out with each QGIS release lets you know which features have been funded um, and who actually developed them. So, if you were interested in one of them, you could contact that developer and ask about how how the funding was provided for that. Um, uh, yeah. And also, um, the, at the bottom of the roadmap, there is all the QGIS funded um, ah, yeah. spreadsheet. But this is usually bug fixing. Um, and and also, we should mention that we don't really like to take um, like targeted funding in QGIS because of the admin overhead. So uh, we early on said, well, if, you, if you're going to donate to QGIS, it's got to be for like the good of the project and we let the PSC like, be responsible to make sure it gets spent wisely. Um, so we don't really have stats on like how many people donated to fix, you know, or implement specific features. But the ones that Niall was mentioning were more like um, developer to business interactions that happen outside of QGIS, which is probably 10x or 50x the amount of money that actually flows into the QGIS project itself. Yeah, I mean, it's probably it's probably about 90% of the development or the funds, the funding for QGIS development comes from direct from end user organizations and then maybe five percent from the qgis.org bucket and maybe five percent from crowdfunding campaigns maybe 40 50 percent of volunteer effort <laughs> somewhere in that mix would be yeah yeah let's answer the I last mean, I mean, there, actually the there, there is a there's a lot of self-interested volunteer yeah. effort though as well so like yeah. the, it, it's a it's a blurry line Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a rapid fire answer to Victoria? I don't know if that's Vicky Victoria or another Victoria, but um, for has anyone tried making Minecraft worlds in QGIS? I know that the opposite is, is true, that there was a plugin. I don't know exactly what the work I need to go find, but somebody was making uh, taking QGIS projects and then exporting them into Minecraft. I think that's <laughs> isn't that what they that's what they're asking, isn't it? 
I don't know if they're asking, can you bring Minecraft world into QGIS or, yeah, no, no, they, QGIS, you're right. Yeah, I think it's yeah. QGIS data into, yes, yeah, spatial yeah. data free QGIS into Minecraft. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there is work out there. If you Google it, you shall find it. Mm. <laughs> As all good things in life. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, great stuff. Thanks and very much. Just, yeah, it just leaves me to say thank you. Um, we will definitely be having more open season, um, open sessions, open seasons, not quite the same thing, um, mm -hmm. open sessions in the future. Um, and I just have to apologize for YouTube having a mild freak out, but we got back up and running and the recording of this will, of course, be on YouTube. Um, so thank you both for um, mm -hmm. fielding all of the questions and your patience. Thanks very much. Uh, See you later. Hang out in the room with us too. That's great to have you all here. Yeah. Cheerio.